Welcome to my channel. I'm Scott, and if you want to catch my newest video, I post one every day at 8 a.m. In this video, I am going to walk you through the process of valuing Philips 66 stock and analyzing its financial ratios. Let me know what you think. Give the video a like, subscribe, or comment below. Also, if you'd like to do a private Zoom session with me to discuss financials, receive a custom valuation for the stock of your choice, or support the channel, you can become a member by clicking the link in the description below. Philips 66 produces natural gas liquids and petrochemicals. The company is active in more than 65 countries. Let's get started with the model. This is a big company, 22.7 billion market cap, so they're a large cap company. They're trading at 51.93 and they have 437 million shares outstanding. To get shares outstanding, it's market cap, divided by stock price gives you shares outstanding. Let's look at the financials. Free cash flow is how you value a company. You estimate the future free cash flows and then you discount that back to today's dollars. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. Capital expenditures are property, plant, and equipment. So if a company has positive free cash flow, they could pay down debt, pay dividends, acquire other businesses, or invest back into their business to grow it. If a company has negative free cash flow, it may not be able to do any of those things. And this company has positive free cash flow. It's a bit bumpy. It's all over the place. It's really low in 2016. It jumps way up to 4.9 billion in 2018, then drops to under a billion in 2019. But it's good to see they have positive free cash flow. Net income is the profit and loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. And they do have positive net income. It's also all over the place. 1.5 billion jumps up to 5.6 billion and then down to 3.1 billion. Let me show you something on their income statement that caused a drop in 2019. When looking at financial statements, there's a lot going on. So it's hard to pinpoint one specific thing. But one thing that does jump out is this write-off of 861 million. It jumps out because it is a pretty big number and it didn't happen in prior years. The amounts are pretty small in prior years. This was an asset impairment. It was a goodwill impairment. Goodwill impairment is a non-cash expense. So this $861 million expense brought down their net income. So it hurts their net income, but it doesn't affect cash flow. Just to give you an example of how goodwill may work, say you acquired a company for $3 billion, but according to that balance sheet, they were worth $2 billion. The way you figure out what they're worth is you take the assets. If they had $5 billion of assets, $3 billion of liabilities, you take the difference. $5 billion minus $3 billion equals $2 billion. So they're worth $2 billion. Since you pay $3 billion and they're worth $2 billion, you have to book $1 billion onto the balance sheet as goodwill. And every year, Following that acquisition, you have to test for goodwill impairment to see what the company's worth today. Say a year from now you tested for goodwill impairment and the company's actually worth $2.5 billion today. So you paid a half a billion more than what it's worth. Since you have $1 billion on the balance sheet as goodwill, you have to take $500 million off of the balance sheet and put it onto the income statement as an expense. So it brings down your net income but it doesn't affect cash because the cash happened years ago when you acquired a company. So you have to adjust for it in your cash flow statement. The 861 million write-off reduced their net income that year. And if we go to statement of cash flows, you can see this asset impairment charge 861 million. So we had to add it back. We had to add it back to cash flow from operations because cash flow from operations starts with net income and you have to adjust it for non-cash items. And a big reason this company has low free cash flow is because their capital expenditures are so high. 2.8 billion, 1.8 billion, 2.6 billion, 3.9 billion. So they have a lot of capex. It's a type of company that has really expensive machinery to do its job. Let's look at their revenue. It goes from 84 billion to 107 billion. So they have a ton of revenue coming in. So that's really good. It does drop from 2018 to 2019. But 107 billion is a massive number and they have low margins because they have such high expenses. The margins are net income divided by revenue. It's how well you convert revenue into profit. And they only converted three to 5% of their revenue into profit. Let's look at a capital structure. They have 11.8 billion of debt, 24.9 billion of equity, 
and they pay 3.89% interest on their debt. Cost of debt is 3.15%. To get cost of debt, it's interest rate times one minus the effective tax rate. And they have 32% debt net capital structure, which means they have 68% equity. And their cost of equity is 14.15%. And we use a capital asset pricing model to figure that out. And part of the CAPM formula is the beta. That's how volatile the stock is relative to the market. Their beta is 1.54. So the stock moves about one and a half times the market. The higher the beta, the higher the cost of equity. And their WAC is 10.62%, which is a blend of the cost of debt and cost of equity. And the WAC is a discount rate companies use when they want to acquire companies or take on new projects. So say for instance, there was a new project that came their way and it cost $1 million upfront to take on the project. But they would receive $100,000 of cash flows over the next 20 years. What they would do is they would discount those future 20 years of cash flows back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. And if they saw the value of the cash flows in today's dollars was 1.5 million, they would take on a project because it cost them 1 million and they'd be making $500,000. But if they discounted those 20 years of cash flows back to today and it was $800,000 in today's dollars, they would not take on a project since the project cost $1 million, they'd be losing $200,000 and you only want to take on projects or ventures that add value to the company. The WAC is a discount rate we're going to apply to the future cash flows for this model. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated terminal value, which is all cash flows past year for that's 22.9 billion. We discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $20.5 billion. We divide that by 437 million shares. And we get a calculated stock price of $47. They're trading at $52, so they're trading at 11% premium. It's a sell according to the model. Simply Wall Street has them valued at $53. Their valuation is based off of the average analyst estimate, so they're saying the stock is slightly undervalued. Let's see where the stock has been trading the past few years. The stock did peak around $120 a couple of times the past two years but it's come down more than half of that number. So it seems like it could be a good value. You just have to feel comfortable with the company's future. But this company I think is gonna be around a long time. I don't think there's too much risk. You just have to wait it out until the stock price goes up. That could be a few months or a few years, you never know. Stock price is not necessarily based off of how well a company is doing financially. It does help, but stock price is only based on supply and demand of the market. If more people think a stock price is gonna go up in the future, they will buy the stock, which will drive the price higher and higher, even if the company is not doing well financially. And if investors feel a stock is gonna do poorly in the future, they won't buy the stock, which will push the price lower and lower. Even if the company is doing well financially, stock market is forward thinking, so you have to understand the psychology of investors and market sentiment, which can be a really tricky thing to do. They have a really good PE. The median for the market is 16.5. The average is 18.3. PE is stock price over earnings per share. To calculate earnings per share, that's net income over shares outstanding. I like to see below 15. They're at 7.4. So investors are paying $7.40 for $1 of earnings. Price of sales is really good. The median is 2.0. The average is 4.8. Price of sales is stock price over sales per share. To calculate sales per share, that's revenue over shares outstanding. I like to see below 2.5, they're at 0.2. So investors are paying 20 cents for $1 of revenue. Price to book is really good also. The median is 2.4, the average is 5.0. Price to book is stock price over book value per share. To calculate book value per share, that's equity over shares outstanding. I like to see below 3.5, they're at 0.9. So investors are paying 90 cents for $1 of book value. Equity is total assets minus total liabilities on a balance sheet. Good interest coverage ratio, the average is 14.7, the median is 4.1. Interest coverage ratio is EBIT over interest expense. I like to see above two, they're at 7.3, so they can easily cover their interest payments. EBIT is earnings before interest and taxes, also called operating income on the income statement. ROE is in line with the average and median. The average is 13%, the median is 12%. ROE is net income over equity. I like to see above 20%, they're at 12%. Current ratio is good. The median is 1.3. The average is 1.8. Current ratio is current assets over current liabilities. I like to see between 1.2 and 2. They're at 1.2, so they can cover their current debts and payables.
Current assets are assets that can be liquidated into cash within 12 months. Cash, accounts receivables, and inventory are examples. Current liabilities are debts and payables that are due within 12 months. Current debt and accounts payable are examples. The best way to look at ratios is to compare them to similar companies. I've done videos on Nestle Oil, PVF, Parkland, Renewable Energy, Valero, and Valvoline, all in the same industry as Philips 66. And if Philips has a number in green, they're better than the average. If they have a number in red, they're worse than the average. So they're better in PE by a good amount. They're also way better in price to sales and price to book. They're doing fine in current ratio, even though they're below average, 1.2 is fine. Everybody in the industry is doing well. ROE, they're much better than the average at 12%. The average is only 5%. Debt, they're a little lower than average at 32%. Market cap, they're 22.7 billion, one of the bigger companies of the bunch. And they pay a really nice dividend, 6.85% which is much better than the average of 3.14%. So to summarize, I do have them trading at 11% premium. Their ratios are amazing and their financials are pretty good. So let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe or comment below. I respond to all comments. Also, if you'd like to do a private Zoom session to discuss financials, receive a custom valuation for a stock of your choice or support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.